Hello, hello, hello. It's lovely to see you all. And yes, I am the second British person for today. This is probably the last time you're going to see us in Europe, but uh, <laughs> enjoy it while it lasts. Right. Um, is everybody ready for a good rant? I like a good moan, don't you? Um, one of the things that, that is frustrating me most about the web these days is dark patterns. Right, And we've all experienced dark patterns, but just in case you're not familiar with the term, dark patterns are user interface elements that have been carefully crafted to trick you into doing things that you might not otherwise do, usually using psychological manipulation. Right? Does everybody know the kind of thing I mean? Yeah, right. So we're talking about things like this on Etsy, where it goes, it's almost gone, there's only one item left. Right? Well, everything on Etsy is single items, isn't it? That's the whole point of the platform. It says right there, handmade item. There is only going to be one, right? And then three people are looking at the cart right now. If you don't act, it's all going to go horribly wrong. I hate this kind of stuff. And it really annoys me. But it's really easy. If you ever want to design with manipulation in mind, it's so simple. Check out this design that I mocked up. I'm selling people insurance with their shoes. Because you want insurance when you buy a pair of shoes, don't you? And I've done it very easily. I'm not, I'm not lying. I'm not doing anything like that. But basically, I put two buttons at the bottom. We've got this button that says, add to basket without insurance. And this one that says, add to basket with insurance. It's clearly labeled, isn't it? Right? It's not my fault if people are stupid and click the bright green button that points onwards. <laughs> right? That's a dark pattern in action. But the trouble is, is we kind of all know they're dirty, don't we? Yeah. Right? <laughs> um, you feel like you will have to wash your hands after every time you do a dark pattern. But you're often bounced into it, aren't you? You're told you have to do it by senior management. And I've got a problem with articles like this, right? Dark pattern design is unethical and irresponsible, right? There, it's entirely right. It's not wrong. I'm not claiming that this is wrong. But just arguing about ethics is very difficult when you're talking to your marketing manager who has to raise conversion rates by the end of the year if he doesn't want to get fired. Right? He's going to interpret those ethics as completely ethical. After all, that shoe one that I showed you, let people buy it without the insurance. Ethics is how you decide to interpret it in your own mind at that moment, right or wrong. So we can't just make an ethical argument if we want to convince other people that um, dark pans are a bad idea. So what I want to do is I want to look at three business reasons, solid business reasons against dark patterns. And then I want to, there's no point of just slagging off dark patterns and saying they're wrong. We then need to give an alternative. So I'm going to share with you three alternatives to dark patterns. But let's start with looking at the three business reasons why dark patterns suck and we shouldn't be using them. Reason number one, consumers are cynical they're savvy, and they're spoilt for choice. The world we live in now isn't the world of madmen, right? Where consumers were a little bit kind of naive and gullible and didn't have a much choice anyway. If you put your message in front of them enough and you said it loud enough and long enough, then people would believe you. That's not the world we live in anymore. Not only is every one of your competitors just a click away, but they know what you're doing. Who's ever booked a holiday on booking.com? <laughs> right? We've all done it, haven't we? We've all booked a, booked a hotel on booking.com. But again, you come away feeling like you've just been conned by a, new, a used salesman, right? For a used car. You know that something a bit suspicious went on there, <laughs> right? You can't put your finger on it, but when you see things like, only six rooms left will expire in 11 hours, 21 other people looking at this page, even though you know what's happening, you go into panic mode. <laughs> your caveman brain's going, I must hoard this room. <laughs> right? 
And of course, they know it. But you know what's happening, don't you? And you might think, oh, well, I'm a designer. Of course, of course I know. I'm so much more educated than the masses, right? <laughs> but it's actually not true. I've done usability testing on Booking.com because I'm a country bugger and I like to find out stuff. And this is one real quote. I hate all this manipulative crap trying to convince me the room is about to sell out. I just ignore that stuff. There is a huge presumption that because dark patterns work, people aren't aware that they're dark patterns. But that's not true. Dark patterns work on a subconscious level. But that doesn't mean we can't be aware of them on a conscious level. So yes, if you use dark patterns, you will see an increase in conversion rate. But just be aware that people know that you're manipulating them, OK? And that opens up all kinds of problems. Because if people know that you're manipulating them, why don't they just go somewhere else? Now, Booking.com, I asked, the, I asked a follow-up question, which is, why do you continue to use Booking.com then? And the answer is, well, it's really easy to use other than that, right? So they continue to get repeat business on my very little study, admittedly, based purely on the usability of their site. It's the usability that overcomes the crapness of the dark pattern. So be very careful, because you will lose repeat business. And also, governments will start getting involved. You know it's blindingly obvious if governments are beginning to get involved, right? If they realize there's a problem, then everybody knows there's a problem. So in the UK, there's a group called the uh, CMA that have taken enforcement action to en bring an end to misleading sales tactics, especially on hotel booking sites, <laughs> right? They might as well have said booking.com. <laughs> OK? So, this isn't going to last forever. This dark pattern's working. Governments are going to get involved. Consumers are becoming more savvy and more cynical. And the trouble is, is one, just one disgruntled customer can completely undermine your brand. So take, for example, the story um, of Hashi... Um, uh, I can't remember his name now. It's gone out of my head. This guy, right? <laughs> So a guy, guy, um, guy's father lost his luggage. His luggage got lost, and um, uh, uh, his son decided that he was going to you know, get the luggage back for his dad. He went through all the process. It was a nightmare. British Airways was useless. He got more and more frustrated. In the end, out of utter frustration, he took out a promoted tweet. So anytime somebody typed in British Airways, they got a message back saying, don't fly British Airways. Their customer service is horrendous. One disgruntled customer. It then got picked up by Mashable and TechCrunch. And then the next day, it got picked up by the BBC, The Guardian, The Telegraph. And they came back in, British Airways staff came back in on Monday morning. This happened over a weekend. And they had a major PR disaster because of one pissed off customer. So when the customer has that much power, let's put this together. We're saying that they're aware that you're using dark patterns and they've got the power to screw your brand over. Suddenly, it's not looking like such a good idea, is it? But, and then, when lots of people get together, it really hits the fan, right? Well, that's when Facebook is having to apologize for doing psychological experiments on users. And it becomes this massive issue, and governments get involved. It's a really dangerous business. But probably the biggest single reason for not using dark patterns is buyer's remorse. Have you ever done that? Have you ever bought something and then gone, no, nah, that was a bad idea? Of course, we all have, haven't we? And so it's for a variety of different reasons. But sometimes it's because you, you were kind of bounced into that sell. You were bounced into buying that thing. Now, a lot of businesses have the attitude, well, pfft, I don't care. As long as we've made the sale, what does it matter that the person is unhappy? But it does matter hugely, partly because they turn around and, and slag you off online. But there are other reasons as well. There are actually some real hidden costs that you can be totally unaware of. So, for example, your UX team is beavering away, and actually it's doing great. 
hey, we've managed to increase the conversion rate in the last quarter by having annoying pop-up overlays and, you know, bait and switch and all of these other things. Aren't we doing well? Ah, hurrah. Meanwhile, in the rest of the company, unbeknownst to the UX team, things are kicking off majorly. So you've got marketing that suddenly are finding that they're having to spend more money to get the same results from their marketing budget. Now, they don't really know why that is. Suddenly, it te seems to be much harder to persuade people to buy. Well, it's because they're having to spend an advertising budget and undoing all the negative PR that's going on around your brand. So there's an increased marketing cost that comes from dark patterns. Meanwhile, the support center is getting this huge number of calls that it didn't have before with angrier and angrier customers, right? Every time somebody rings a call center in the UK, it costs an average of three pounds and 21 pence for every customer, right? I once worked with a, 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 custom, um, a, a company who sold kettles, right? And they decided to do that sneaky thing where you add something to people's shopping basket without telling them, right? So you add a kettle to the basket, and it also added a load of filters, right? The expensive on-brand filters, right? And so people, and sure enough, they sold a lot more filters. Who would know? But what they were unaware of is that people were calling the support line and moaning about it. Now, the filters cost £2.50, and the support call cost £3.20. They were losing money. So you've got to think about the broader impact across the business. And then the other example is returns. Processing returns is massively expensive and complicated and time consuming. You're having to deal with calls and emails and postage and packaging, re, um, uh, you know, processing those incoming ones, working out which ones can be resold, which ones have to be re, um, restocked, which ones just have to be discarded. It's an expensive and time-consuming business. So the last thing we want is unhappy customers. Unhappy customers cost our business. So I hope there you can see three solid business reasons why dark patterns are bad. But we can't stop there. Because if you're Mr. Mr. Marketing Lead who has to get his results, just saying all these bad things are going to happen, he's going to go, I don't care. I just care about my target, what I've got to achieve. Okay? So we point out the bigger business uh, problems with dark patterns, but then we need to go on and offer alternatives. So what are our alternatives? Well, actually, there are so many. There are so many other things we can do, things that are far more effective than just doing, putting things in people's shopping basket or scaring them that, th um, that uh, sales might run out. But I'm just going to focus on three, because I was going to go, I was going to focus on three. I need an extra finger there. Um, we're going to look at three, in, because we don't have that long. Number one is you want to address people's objections and reduce their risks. You see, we've got this thing called the primal brain, right? And it's the fight and flight part of our brain. And it's always looking out for dangers and risks. So even something as simple as a newsletter sign-up form kicks the primal brain into action. And it starts panicking and it starts looking for danger. You know, what if they sell my email address to third parties? What if the content's rubbish? What if it's hard to unsubscribe? What if they send me too many emails? What if they pressure me into buying? What if I get hacked? Right? And it kicks off this train of subconscious thoughts that puts us off of taking action. So we've got to address these objections and these risks very clearly in our user interfaces. We don't want to avoid them. Right? We don't want to avoid those risks. We've all heard the rumors about McDonald's, haven't we? Right? About the chicken nuggets not having necessarily the nicest pieces of a chicken in. Right? Or that the fries don't actually contain potato and these various rumours that fly around. Now, the trouble is, McDonald's could sit there going, I hope no one realises, I hope no one realises, I hope no one realises. Or, I hope, I, I, and we're not going to mention that, because if we mention that, it's just going to spread the rumour. 
right? It's going to bring more attention to it. But actually, good for them, they address it. They actually address these objections head on. Now, they don't say, we know what you're thinking. You think that chicken nuggets are made up of chicken's testicles, right? <laughs> um, they don't go that far. But what they do do is they say things like, it always contains 100% chicken breast meat. Why do they feel a need to point that out? They feel the need to point it out because they know the rumours. They know what people say about their brand. They know the objections people have to buying their products. So what are the objections people have that stop them buying your products? Do you know? If you don't know, run a survey. Find out. Also, don't make people search for the answers to these questions. So a great example is a newsletter sign-up form again, right? So people are worried about privacy and security and what you're going to do with their data and all that kind of stuff. So you're signing up for a newsletter, right? You get to the newsletter form. This all goes through your head. And then what you've got to do, if you want to answer those questions on most sites, you have to scroll all the way down to the bottom and search for that tiny link that says privacy policy, which you then click through to and don't understand a word that's written there because it's all written in legalese, right? On my website, I put that I will never share your email address message right next to the form so that people don't have to search for, um, for answers to these objections. And you also, wherever possible, you want to give a user a sense of control in what they're doing. They control the risk, control the perceived danger, because that will reassure them. So there's two ways you can do that. Don't leave me wondering about what's happening. Communicate to me regularly. Inform me about what's going on. But also, um, let me undo a mis any mistakes that I make. For example, can I return an item or easily cancel a subscription? That gives me a sense of control. It reassures me. It encourages me to take action. Number two, defeat cognitive load. One of the big problems, one of the big reasons that people fail to act on our website is because they don't notice the things they need to notice in order to be convinced and to act. They don't see the call to action button. And cognitive load you know, has huge consequences. If we're feeling stressed, if we're feeling harassed, if we're feeling um, overwhelmed, everything feels like hard work. It feels unfamiliar and confusing. It feels untrue. And it makes us feel bad. and puts us in a bad mood. And that is ironic, considering when we get in a bad mood, our cognitive load goes up even further. And so we get into this loop. But it's not just bad mood that put, makes our cognitive load high. Confusing, inconsistent interface displays, you know, where things move around or change or aren't where they're expected to be. And also where we don't conform to, to um, uh, kind of conventions. So the search box isn't in the top right-hand corner or, um, you know, you've got a weird and wacky layout. It will confuse people and overwhelm them. Fortunately, you can deal with cognitive load simply by simplifying your interface. I go through every single element on, on a page, right, when I'm optimizing conversion, and I ask myself three questions about every single element on the page. I ask myself, can I remove this? What would happen if I removed it? Would it undermine sales, or would it actually just remove clutter? If an item isn't specifically helping conversion, then it's harming it. If I can't remove an item because it would be damaging for whatever reason, I ask myself, well, could I hide this? Can I put it under an accordion or a tab? Can I move it deeper in the information architecture? If I can't do that for whatever reason, maybe I'm legally required to keep that content on the page, then the next thing I do is I shrink it so that there's a strong visual hierarchy where the most important elements are big and there are other things that are smaller. So you simplify. And then there's all kinds of design tricks that you can do to make sure people see what you want them to see. I did this little mock-up to demonstrate it. And there's a whole load of things going on in here, and I'll do it very quick. For a start, look at the headline and the, the line of text underneath. It's creating a V-shape that's drawing your attention to the Shop Now button. The Shop Now button itself is a contrasting color. It really stands out from the rest of the design. But we've also got this habit of following people's eye lines. Look at this man down here. OK, he's wearing a VR headset, so he can't actually see anything. But the principle still stands. If you follow his eye line, where does it go? It goes to the Shop Now button. 
Look at this guy's hand. He's actually frigging pointing at the shop button, right? But it doesn't need to be just people you use either. There's other things that you could use. You can use shapes and patterns and that kind of thing. So if we look at this woman here and look at on the back of her head, what's she got on the back of her head? She's got an arrow there. And the arrow is pointing at the shop now button. And then my piece de resistance, the real thing that makes you look at that button, is it's got a woman's bottom beside it. <laughs> and I don't care whether you're a man or a woman, we are all pre-programmed to look at bottoms, right? So there's a lot of design decisions that you can make that will draw people's eyes in the right direction. But design is more than just bottoms. I'm sorry to break that to you. It's also putting people in a good mood. We want people to be in a good mood. So here's a screen capture from the Smashing Magazine website. And they've got a membership program that they want to indoctrinate you into signing up to. It's actually a really good membership program. Um, but I am a non-executive director of Smashing Magazine. <laughs> um, but what's really good about this is it's, everything on it is designed to put you in a good mood. It's designed to make you feel positive, and the more positive you are, the lower your cognitive load is. The more you'll be able to see and concentrate. So we've got some great stuff going on here. Obviously, we've got the very, um, we've got the, the animations with the cats, and it's very smiley and personable and, and upbeat. We've got the vibrant colours that are really friendly and, and approachable. On top of that, we've got these lovely little design delighters on rollover, you know, where it just moves a little bit and makes you go, oh, you know. And then, best of all, is the, is the language. So if you're willing to spend a whole massive $9 a month, you get to be part of the I Feel Smashing Club, right? The copy reinforces it as well. Every element of that is designed to put you in a good mood. The other problem when it comes to cognitive load is we ask people to think about too many things simultaneously, right? Sign up for our newsletter, make a purchase, follow me on social media, share this. What do you want me to do? Pick one and stick with it. We're constantly overwhelming people with far too many options, with far too many things. The final thing, to wrap things up, I want to encourage you to make it fast. Now, I know we've got a room primarily of designers in here, but do you know who can have the most impact on conversion? And that's developers. Are there any developers in the room? Good for you. You guys rock. As designers, we never say that to you. We say we hate you. We say we talk about you all the time behind your back. <laughs> but you, when it comes to increasing conversion, you are the heart and soul of things. Because speed matters. And the next time a designer turns around to you and says, I want these 28 web fonts, right? Tell them where to go. Let's look at how profound an impact conversion rate, um, uh, sorry, performance has on the conversion rate, right? For every two seconds of load time, you will lose 4.3% of revenue per visitor, right? You will see a 3.8% reduction in clicks and a 1.8% drop off in queries. Performance has a massive impact on your conversion rate. 79% of such shoppers won't return to a slow-loading website. And 44% of shoppers will share a bad experience with their friends. That's not good. We're not in a good position. So how do we ensure our websites are fast? And as designers, we need to think about this well. We can't just expect the, the developers to do some kind of magic. You know, they do some... I don't know, sacrifice a chicken or whatever they do. <laughs> we have to take responsibility too in this, right? So there's various ways we need to start thinking about performance. First of all, we need to speed up imagery. We th need to think about image compression, right? I'm sorry, it's dull, but we do. We need to consider how big we're having images, the amount of compression that we're applying to them, even the, what's in the images. If it's a picture of it, if I took a picture of you guys now and put that online, it would compress like crap because there's so much detail going on. Also, none of you young whippersnappers realize that red compresses really badly, right? I had to worry about those things when we were on 28K modems. 
So, image compression matters. Also, using a content delivery network. Now, this is a bit more techy, but it is worth considering. And if you, um, even my little blog runs on a content uh, delivery network. Try using one of these services to see what your website looks like when it's being loaded from Australia. It's like they live in the third world, right? For lots of reasons, but partly because of performance. <laughs> also, optimize your CSS and JavaScript, right? We need to make sure that we're using JavaScript lightly and, and not relying on it too heavily because it will slow performance down, especially on mobile devices. And then finally, watch those web fonts, right? Be careful with your web fonts, people. Don't get carried away. So there you go. That's, that's basically all I want to share with you. Um, just to briefly recap that, if my clicker has decided to stop working. So what we're saying is that dark patterns are dangerous because consumers are cynical. Customers can undermine your brand. And most importantly, buyer's remorse can be incredibly damaging and costly to your business. And your alternative is to address users' objections, overcome their cognitive load, and make it fast. If you want to know more about this kind of stuff I've put, um, and learn more about conversion rate optimization, then check out that web address and you'll find a load more. But for now, thank you very much.